And we're going to start with the, the basic understanding of maritime theory as it applied to European expansionism in the second half <laughs> of the 19th century, uh, shortly before Tirpitz tried to, to build the, the... Okay, what we're going to be doing tonight is chapter 3 and 4 of, uh, uh, of our catechism. <laughs> you just want to sort of crawl into a hole sometimes, don't you? I'm sorry. A lot of people wish I'd crawl into a hole, as a matter of fact, and not come out. And other people say they think I already had crawled into a hole based on how I look. It's just, you know, so. All right, but, you know, these things happen all the time. Uh, <clears throat> Last week, uh, Father David was talking to us about, in effect, proving God's existence. Was that a hand? No? Good? Okay. Proving God's existence or searching for God, uh, the basic idea underlying that, of course, is uh, that we want to know. We want to know the truth. Is there a God? And if so, what is He like? Who is He? Uh, John Paul II, uh, very famous Pope, uh, all of us remember him probably, uh, his training was, uh, he was essentially a philosopher. Benedict XVI is a theologian by training. John Paul II was a philosopher. And he once pointed out that just about everybody wrestles with the questions at some point. Who am I? Where am I going? What is truth? And the name for a person who asks these questions is a philosopher. Uh, someone who loves learning. Someone who is involved in a search for truth. So if we accept, based on what Father David told us last week, that God exists, then the next question is, well, what is he like? What is the truth about him? That's what we want to know. And so that's what we're going to be looking at tonight for the next three and a half hours. Y'all did tell everybody you were going to be late tonight, right? Good, good, very well. So You think I'm kidding, don't you? <laughs> well, how do we know the truth about God? He reveals himself to us, yes. There are actually a couple of different ways. There are two different complementary ways that we know about God. One is through natural human reason. That the reasonable, intelligent human mind can look at the world, can look at the universe, can look at nature, can analyze how it works, can understand it using that reason and based on that understanding know something about the nature of God. Uh, and some of those we talked about last week. For instance, God as first cause, as prime mover. If you study nature, if you study the natural sciences, you come to understand something of the principles of causation. So in a way you're looking into the mind of God. Uh, anybody here do math, like doing math, mathematicians? Okay. God invented math, and then he used it to create the entire universe. So by understanding mathematics, you are looking directly into the mind of God. Is that not cool? I mean, think, think about the orderly and orderliness and reasonableness of mathematics. Uh, look at the orderly change of seasons. Uh, there's a lot you can know about the nature of God, assuming for a minute that nature is a painting. If you look at the painting, you can learn something about the character of the person who painted it, right? I'm a photographer. You look at my photography, and you can immediately tell that I have a, a sick and twisted mind that likes gothic stuff and death and decay and all that good stuff. I just, I, you know, I do gothic stuff. That's what I do. So, uh, you know something about the painter. So, looking at God's creation, you know something about God. But, 
You don't know everything about God. As a matter of fact, there's the amount that you don't know about God is still greater than the amount that you do know. So that's the, the first important thing to understand. Using your own natural reason, anybody in the world can know something about God if they look correctly. You don't even have to be Christian. In a way, you don't even have to be a theist. Uh, I, think, I think some scientists who are atheists, and I don't think there are a, lot of, a whole lot of them, actually know more about God than they think, uh, even though they profess that there is no God. Uh, very interesting thought there. But beyond that point, and we'll draw an arbitrary point, it's on the other side of my glass here. Reason can take us up to the glass. This much we can know about God through the, applying our own ability to think and analyze. But beyond that, our reason cannot take us. Therefore, if we're going to learn something about God, some of this truth that's on this side of the line, then the only way that we can learn it is if God himself comes across this line and reveals some of these truths to us, to reveal truth about himself, his nature, his purpose to us. That's the only way we can know this stuff. And there are actually, to my knowledge, three religions, and there may be more uh, in the world, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, who take that essential view. These are what we call the Abrahamic religions, because all three of them trace their origins back to Abraham. Now, they do it in different ways, and the relationship between them is, uh, is an interesting one. Uh, according to the Christian, Judaism is the first stage, Christianity is the second and final stage, and Islam is a misunderstanding. And yet, they all share this basic notion uh, that God reveals himself to us. So all these religions are based on revelation. That's not the book of revelation, that's little r revelation. God stepping into history and revealing something about himself to us. Um, and that Christians further hold that Christ is the fullest, most complete, total revelation because he is God himself. Uh, some of you can probably tell me a lot, to say a lot better than I, uh, where this biblical passage appears in the Gospels, but if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You're looking at him. This is it. There's literally nothing left to reveal after this point because you're, you're seeing it all. He's right there in front of you. And so that's, you, you can't really imagine a fuller revelation than that if you're going to believe Christ. Uh, you, you've all probably heard, or most of you have heard, the idea of Lord, liar, or a lunatic. There are three options. Either Christ is who he said he is, and therefore we can trust everything he says. Or he's a pathological liar, or he was a nutcase. There is no fourth option. This idea about, well, Jesus was, was just a man, but he was a good man. He was a great moral teacher. That's the last thing he was. I don't know any liars or people who have severe mental problems who are great moral teachers. So he's either who he said he was, he's a liar, or he's a lunatic. He's not just a human being who's a great moral teacher. So if you, if you buy that Christ is who he said he is, then you also buy that he is the fullest and most complete revelation of God. The question arises, how do we know the truth about Christ? Christ rises from the dead, he ascends into heaven, and suddenly he is, in a physical corporeal sense, not there anymore. And almost immediately, almost immediately, questions start arising as to what Christ really taught. What did he really say? Because, you know, Christ did not, did not rent airtime on the nearest TV station. He didn't have a web page or a blog. All right, the, the means of mass communication were much more limited back then. And so there was a lot of hearsay. There was a lot of rumor. And, and so immediately questions came up about who was this person? What did he really teach? What did he really say? I've heard rumors, but, but tell me, what do I want to know? Now let me ask you this. If you want to know the truth about somebody and that somebody isn't there, you can't go right to the horse's mouth, then who do you ask? Where do you go to find the truth? 
Why, why the disciples? Yeah, the people who were in a position to best observe what happened, who knew him the best, who talked to it, who did get it from the horse's mouth. And these were the disciples, uh, his closest followers, the people that he picked out and who followed him. So as questions arose, uh, these are the ones that, uh, uh, that people sought out from the very, very beginning. Well, what if they got it wrong? Well, that's an interesting question. You've got God, sovereign Lord and master of the universe. I am who I am, who has come to earth in the flesh to tell us about himself. And yet he forgets to make a provision to make sure that other generations will get the same truth. It would seem logical to me that God, in the person of the Holy Spirit, who soon after Jesus' attention, uh, ascension descended on the disciples and, and on the other believers, would make sure that when the disciples, who are now apostles, were talking about Jesus and explaining about Jesus and teaching about Jesus, that what they taught was correct. Uh, how many Protestant Christians do we have here? I know we're coming from a lot of different places. Okay, uh, you believe that the Scripture is infallible, right? Okay, then is it so hard to believe that God could extend that same infallibility uh, not just to Moses, not just to Peter, who incidentally did in fact write a couple of books of, uh, of the New Testament, uh, not just to Jeremiah, not just to Isaiah, but to Christ's disciples, his apostles. It's not all that far a stretch, is it? To make sure that when they preached, when they wrote things down, they wouldn't get it wrong. There's really no other way to figure out that, you know, how you're going to get this accurate revelation of God otherwise. So the idea is that Christ anointed, ordained, chose uh, these disciples. But then they're going to die at some point, right? Well, as a matter of fact, Judas kind of died real early on. And he, in fact, was one of the disciples, right? So, in the book of Acts, what do they do about this? They're short a disciple. What do you do? Let's hold an election. We've got to replace him. And they elected, they prayed, and they chose Matthias. I should have asked you all that. I should have tested your biblical and scriptural knowledge there. All right, well, what happens when Matthias dies? Or what happens when Peter gets crucified? Or the others uh, get martyred in various horrible ways? Well, it stands to reason they're going to do what they did in Judas's case. They're going to pick successors, right? Does anything I've said so far seem illogical? And that it would also stand to reason that these successors would have that same God-given infallibility that the original disciples would. All right, this is what we call apostolic succession. I should have a board... Teach without chalk, it's a terrible thing. I don't need it, sorry. Apostolic succession. They can write it down, they're smart. Yeah. Apostolic succession. That the apostles chose their successors. And these successors, uh, we call in English bishops. Uh, the Greek word for it is episkopoi, uh, like episcopal. Uh, episkopoi, which in Greek essentially means overseers. Thank you. You see, I say it and it shows up. It's wonderful. It's great. It's Do I owe you anything, Vanna? Okay, thank goodness. No, I don't. You're out of luck. So, thank you, Vanna. Okay. Succession. Yeah, all right. The disciples who become those who are sent i.e. apostles who choose the bishops. I mean, in a manner of speaking, uh, you can see the apostles, the original twelve, as the first bishops, but they are not, they're not normally referred to as that. Uh, but, but that's what they were. They were bishops, the overseers, the leader of the church, who then chose their successors, who then chose their successors, who then chose their successors generation after generation after generation until here we have the Bishop of Savannah who for right now, just for the next few days, is uh, Kevin Boland. Uh, we're about to get a new bishop 
in this diocese, uh, who can trace his office, if you will, straight back to the original disciples, just in the exact same way that President Obama can trace his office back to George Washington who can trace it back to the founders who wrote the Constitution. Are we making sense so far? And that when these bishops teach on matters of the faith, the Holy Spirit is not going to let them get it wrong. Very important. Uh, and the chief bishop, uh, the bishop in chief, the, the first among equals, was whom? Yeah. St. Peter, you're, you're a rock. On this rock, I'm going to build my church. I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. Uh, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Uh, so on and so forth. Uh, so you would think that whoever was the successor of Peter would be the chief of the bishops, right? And Peter ended up going to and preaching in Rome, capital of the world at that point, right? So Peter was the Bishop of Rome. So who is the Bishop of Rome today? Benedict XVI, more colloquially known as the Pope, the Papa, the Holy Father. Direct uh, apostolic descendant, not, not biological of course, but apostolic descendant of St. Peter. Uh, all seems to hang together very nicely. Well, uh, why have all this stuff? I mean, why not just read it in the Bible? Well, this is where it gets interesting. Where is this revelation about Christ contained? Well, it's contained in a thing called sacred tradition. I always put my pens down somewhere, and then I'll spend the rest of the class wandering around looking for it. Sacred tradition. And I capitalize that. Capital S, capital T. Especially the T. Well, wait a minute, what about the Bible? Well, newsflash. The Bible, or specifically the New Testament, is part of sacred tradition. Uh, the word traditio is, it, it literally means that which is handed on. Uh, anybody know Latin? Trad, I guess, for hand, uh, something like that. Uh, some other examples would be betray, from which we get the word treason to hand over, uh, and you actually find that phrase used in the New Testament, when Jesus was handed over to be crucified, to be betrayed. Uh, so handing on. So tradition is that which is handed on. And sacred tradition is the full complete truth about Christ that the disciples saw and witnessed and experienced for themselves. And that the Holy Spirit is going to preserve that tradition free of doctrinal error in the exact same way that Moses, a sinful human being, just like the rest of us, was preserved from error when he wrote portions of the Old Testament. When Isaiah was preserved from error when he wrote a book of the Old Testament, even though he was a sinful man. Because yes, uh, there have been some horribly sinful bishops and post, popes over time in terms of their personal holiness or lack thereof. But God's not going to let that personal sinfulness get in the way of them handing on a truth. Uh, the way that I found most interesting, the, the thing that struck me as the strongest, my spiritual director once said, God loves his church so much and wants his people to have the truth that if somehow Satan incarnate were elected pope, the Holy Spirit would prevent him from teaching error. Got to remember that. That this is not a tug of war between equals, God and Satan, struggling over things. God invented Satan, okay? And then Satan rebelled. But God's in charge of everything, including Satan himself. God's not going to let the church teach error because he wants you to have the truth too much. And he does this through the handing on of sacred tradition. Now, sacred tradition can be broken into a couple of, couple of parts. Uh, one, well, let me back up for a moment and talk about this word tradition. You need to understand tradition and you need to capitalize it because not all Catholic traditions are sacred tradition. <laughs> there are a lot of Catholic traditions that we call little t traditions. For instance, it's a little t tradition to, 
uh, I don't know, say a prayer called the Angelus at what? Six, noon, and six? That's right. Okay. That's not required. That's not a matter of doctrine. If you don't want to say the Angelus at 6, 12, and 6, you don't have to do it. That's a little t. All right. It is a little t, probably, Catholic tradition, that, generally speaking, priests remain celibate. Little t tradition. Theoretically, that could be changed. In fact, I happen to know one or two married Catholic priests. It's highly unusual. There are only special circumstances when you find it. Uh, but that could be changed that, overnight. I don't think it's going to happen. I don't probably think it's a good idea that it happened. But I'm just giving you an idea that there are some little t traditions or disciplines that can change. Not everything is sacred tradition. But if it's sacred tradition, uh, that's, that's inviolate. That's the big boy. Uh, and there are a couple of, yes? Uh, could you give us a couple of examples before you move on, just so everybody's clear on what the big t tradition or the big t tradition are? Uh, yes, God exists. Uh, he exists in three persons. Uh, that one of those persons uh, took on human flesh uh, and took on human nature uh, and became our Savior. You know, these things are not, uh, they're not really not open to challenge. They've been established. Uh, the Pope is not going to wake up tomorrow and say, no, it's actually a quadrinity, not a trinity. He's not going to say, oh, miscounted, there are only two of them, not three of them. One God, three persons, that's part of sacred tradition. Uh, you find sacred tradition in two forms. One is the written form, and the other is the unwritten form. They are both part and parcel of the same tradition. There is no conflict between them. There is no tension between them. They're both the same thing, just in different forms. The written part of sacred tradition we call sacred scripture, i.e. the Bible. But, as the Bible itself tells us at the conclusion of the Gospel of John, Jesus did a lot of other things that aren't written in here. And if we try to write them down, the whole world, I suppose, could not contain all these books. Nothing in the Bible says that all of God's revelation about himself is written in the Bible. So there is a lot of unwritten sacred tradition as well. And this is something that, uh, this is a stumbling block that Protestants tend to have trouble with. Uh, because the Protestant tradition really got started at the same time that the printing press came to Europe. And therefore, Luther focused very heavily on the written word that a literate person, he claimed, could read and understand and interpret for himself. Uh, so sacred tradition is something that, that Protestants tend to have some, some trouble with. And that's why I'm pointing out that if you're reading the Bible, you're reading sacred tradition. It's just that part that's written down. And what, what does an evangelical do when he wants to talk to somebody about maybe becoming a Christian or learning about Christianity? He does what, like the Gideons at the fair? Hands him a Bible, right? Well, what do you do before there was a Bible? And when 90% of people couldn't read? Well, pictures, yes, but you know, not many good artists either. The point is, the Bible, the canon of Scripture, didn't come along until three or 400 years into Christianity. That, therefore, something predated that, and that is this unwritten thing we call sacred tradition. Uh, we actually have something like that in this country. Uh, it's called the common law. Uh, those lawyers out there will understand this. That there is a whole lot of law out there that is not written down by Congress, that is not written down by the Georgia General Assembly. Uh, it's decided on a case-by-case -case basis by judges. Uh, even though it's not written down, it's still part of the law. And so I have found, in, in my experience when teaching the faith, that lawyers instinctively understand the concept of sacred tradition. Uh, they see the Bible as legislation, and they see unwritten sacred tradition as the common law. And they are both sor legitimate sources of law that work together to give us the principles of our legal system. Uh, very interesting idea. So for your idea that if something isn't written down, it can't be, well, you have been living your entire life in a society here that uh, expressly contradicts that idea, the common law system. Matter of fact, the common law, the phrase that is used in the United States and in England and in other countries in the British Isles, actually comes from the Catholic 
concept, uh, communio juris, juris. So it's a Catholic concept. All right. Um, but once again, this unwritten sacred tradition and this written sacred tradition, they cannot contradict each other because they are part of the same thing. I'll give you some ideas of, uh, of how this works. Um, some people say that, well, Pope, the Pope, you know, nothing about the Pope is found in Scripture. Well, in the first place, yes, but in the second place, it doesn't even really matter if, he, if there isn't. How many of you who, who thought that at some point or know somebody who thinks that uh, believe in the Incarnation? I mean, do we believe in the Incarnation? Do we believe in the Trinity? Well, Incarnation, the word is not found in the Bible. Trinity is not found in the Bible. And yet we accept those. Uh, they're doctrines that are there. Sacred tradition just fleshes them out a little bit for us. Well, where does Scripture come into this? Uh, let, me, let me do a digression for a minute and talk a little bit more about Scripture's role in sacred tradition and the handing on of the truth about God before I get back into the, uh, to the unwritten stuff. Um, let me find my handout for you. I brought you all kind of neat and nifty stuff here. That's uh, my shopping list. Okay, well, you know, these things happen. Remind me to go to the store, somebody, when I get out of here? Okay. Uh, ta -ta, ta -ta, ta -ta. I meant to put uh, dividers in here, and I didn't do it. So, yeah, got it. Do I have a lovely assistant here somewhere? Uh, no. <laughs> There we go. Somebody send them around. <clears throat> Let's talk about how Catholics read the Bible. What? Catholics read the Bible? Well, not as much as they should. Um, I like to joke whenever I see Bibles in the bookstore here that we need to get those things out. We're Catholics. We don't read the Bible. And yet we do. Uh, we need to know how to read it. And you probably know too, if you did your catechism reading for this week, There are two basic ways to read Scripture. Uh, the first way, or the first sense, is the literal sense. The literal sense. Oh, that's interesting. And, well, I, you, know, I, you can read this for yourself. I'm not going to stand here and read this handout for you. Uh, but the literal sense is the most important sense uh, it's the most straightforward way, but it's not the only way. Then there's the spiritual sense, and this is where it gets interesting and it gets a little bit complex because there are three subheadings of spiritual sense. And you also have to keep in mind that you can read the same biblical passage in all four ways. It's not that uh, John chapter 1 verse 2 is the literal sense and John chapter 1 verse 3 is the anagogical sense. No. It's possible to take any section of the Bible and to read it in four different ways, at least theoretically. And so as for an example, let's take Jerusalem and just look at the examples and see the different ways you can understand the Bible when somebody is talking about Jerusalem. And I will, uh, I will leave that to you. And it's important that I say, I can leave that to you, because a lot of people have this idea that uh, the Catholic Church, A, doesn't let its members read the Bible, and B, tells them what they must believe about every single syllable in it. Uh, you're going to find that as a Catholic, you have a great degree of latitude as to what to believe in many, many different things. There is no official... Uh, guide to interpreting the Bible. That the church does not see its job as running around being the thought police. And it's going to try very hard to let you reach your own interpretations and do your own readings. Uh, the problem comes that if somebody uh, reads something that is really wrong, and not just wrong, but it's wrong in a way that can mislead people on a very major point that the church usually moving with glacial speed gradually creeps into the bait and listens and says 
No, my son, that's not what the founders, what, what the founders, I'm back to 1776 here. That's not what the church fathers could have meant. That's an error. That the magisterium, and I, I'll, the magisterium I'll explain in just a minute, but it's the interpreter of sacred tradition, functions as a guardrail. If you hold that idea, you are straying from the truth that God gave to Christ, that Christ gave to the church, that you may know him and love him better and serve him better. So if you've got that idea, it's wrong. Now that doesn't happen all that much. It does happen. There are a few examples of that, and I will uh, talk about it in a little bit, a little bit later. Uh, but, but that's what the church does, uh, that it needs to correct these things. Uh, and that's important because there are a lot of scripture passages that have different reasonable meanings. Uh, it is, I suppose, somewhat reasonable, it is plausible to say that when Christ, at, at first glance at least, to say that when Christ said, this is my body, he was speaking symbolically. It, I will go so far as to say that at first glance there is some plausibility for that idea. Because Christ did, of course, use figures of speech. I am the vine, you are the branches. He used parables. So, I say again with qualification, at first glance, you can say that, well, maybe he was speaking, uh, speaking metaphorically here. Uh, the very fact that there are different reasonable interpretations on their face of this statement requires there to be an authoritative interpreter to say, well, this one's the right interpretation, this one's the wrong one. Because depending on how you interpret that saying, this is my body, then what's up there in the tabernacle is either a piece of bread or it is God. And that's a pretty, that's a pretty basic problem, isn't it? To decide what is and what is not God. And so you have to have some authoritative interpreter whom you can trust to say, no, my son, the founders could not have meant it symbolically. And the reason they couldn't have, and then the, the church usually goes on to give reasons, often based heavily in scripture. Uh, for instance, this is the new Passover. This is the new covenant. Let's go back to the old Passover, the old covenant. Uh, when the death angel was, was coming through the land of Egypt, what did you have to do to, in order to be protected from the death angel? You had to eat animal crackers that, that were symbolizing the lamb, right? And you were saved. No. All the Egyptians were eating animal crackers that night and they came to a very bad end. You actually have to eat the lamb. <laughs> Just as in John the Baptist who said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Wait a minute. I think I heard that recently. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Where did I? Oh yeah, I heard it Sunday at Mass. See how it all works together? Okay, so, so in, in basic matters like that, when somebody could conceivably come to a at least superficially reasonable interpretation of Scripture that really leads you astray from that truth, that's when the church jumps in and says, or usually crawls in slowly and says, sorry. And keep in mind that that's an ongoing problem, that nobody really challenged the idea of the real presence of transubstantiation until several hundred years into the medieval period. You have to have an ongoing interpreter because you never know when a new uh, question mark is going to come up. I study the Constitution for a living. It's what I do. It's four pages long. It's written in English 200 years ago. Compare that to all these books of Scripture that were written in Greek, in Hebrew, by many different authors thousands of years ago and I'm telling you, I still can't understand the Constitution completely. All right? It's very hard for me to understand the Scripture, even if I'm a Scripture scholar. And cases of first impression still come up. Second Amendment, right, to keep and to bear arms? The Supreme Court finally, after 200 plus years, finally, finally, got to the meaning of that one two years ago. So you need to have an ongoing interpreter. These bishops who are still with us, the office of the papacy, it works very nicely and very logically if you think about it. Uh, Cardinal Newman, John Cardinal Newman, is he blessed by now? Blessed John Cardinal Newman, uh, an Englishman, 
born about 200 years ago, uh, a priest of the Church of England, spent a great deal of his time uh, trying to prove that the Church of England was part of what he called the Catholic Church, that the true Church existed in three branches, Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, and the Church of England. He wrote a book to prove that the Church of England was one of these branches. By the end of the book, he realized he had to become Catholic. And that's exactly what he did. And he became a cardinal uh, and is now on the way to sainthood. But he once made a very interesting statement. He said, uh, and this is, a, this is from memory, I just jotted this down a minute ago, but this is certainly the crux of it. Scripture cannot be used to teach doctrine, but only to prove it. Scripture cannot be used to teach doctrine, but only to prove it, if you catch the distinction. It can't be used to teach doctrine because it's frankly too confusing. Constitution, four pages, English, me, Bible, Greek, you, me, all up. Okay, big. All right, new stuff. You know, you know, people are coming in with new ideas, new thoughts all the time. You can't teach doctrine from Scripture because you can take Scripture in so many different directions. Now, once you know what the correct teaching is, then you can look in Scripture and find support for it. You can find its proof. It's easy at that point. It's, oh, it makes perfect sense that way. So this is why we stress uh, unwritten tradition and the role of the Pope and the bishops in interpreting this tradition. Because it's an ongoing, living institution that can face new issues as they arise and pray about them and be guided by the Holy Spirit uh, even though they're a bunch of sinners, just like Moses, just like Aaron, just like uh, all, the, uh, all the Old Testament prophets, reach a right decision. Makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Really, well, it does to me anyway. Well, what about this process of interpretation? What about this process of interpretation? Now, uh, one more thing I will mention about it before I talk about the nuts and bolts is that you will not find a doctrine of the church, and, and I've really said this before if you think about it, you will not find any doctrines of the church that contradict scripture. And I would imagine that all of them have some scriptural support to a greater or less degree, uh, if you just know how to look at it. Uh, for instance, once again, the idea of Pope. Well, Christ gave Peter the keys of the kingdom. If you look at the location of where he did that, uh, was it Caesarea? I can't remember, but it's, it, uh, the, the idea, I think they had the nickname of the Gates of Hell, that changing somebody's name in the Bible is a sign of a major shift. Uh, and you've got, uh, you've got Jacob into Israel, you've got Saul into Paul, you've got Simon into Peter. The keys of the kingdom, if you look at the Old Testament, I mean, that is, that's essentially delegating full authority. Why can a priest forgive sins? Only God can forgive sins. That's right. But God can delegate that authority to someone else if he chooses. He's God. So it's not the priest that's forgiving sins. It's God using the priest to forgive sins. So yeah, you get these ideas. So, um, so it's in there. You can find scriptural basis for the papacy. Very interesting stuff. But anyway, on to the magisterium. Okay, lovely assistant. No, I don't know how you say. Um, there we are. And... Uh, Hmm? Hey, very good. I'll keep one if I may. There we are. Now, there's not going to be a test on this. You don't, you don't have to memorize all this stuff. I, mainly, get a, take a glance at it and get a sense of how it works. Two nights before Easter, we're not going to be sitting up here in a panel asking you for, to describe obsequium religi religiosum and, and who that belongs to on this chart. We're not going to do that. But you need to have a, an overall sense of how this thing works. This is what is called the magisterium. I'm not going to write that down because you, you're seeing it right before you here. The magisterium of the church. And, and that's from magister, which means teacher. Uh, I suppose that's also the, the root word of magistrate. But there are different levels of magisterium. And the one that you 
may have come across at some point, because this, this does pop up now and then, is the top of the list, the ex cathedra, which means from the chair or out of the chair. That when the Pope sits himself down on his papal throne and he says, so let it be written, so let it be done, excuse me, Yulebrenner, sorry about that, um, Pharaoh, okay, but, but that's essentially what happens, that, that that is a definitive truth that the Holy Spirit has revealed through the church, and that requires you, if you're going to profess the faith of Catholicism, to accept because God himself, speaking through the church, has revealed it. That's only happened about twice. All right, you know, for people who are sort of hung up on, uh, on the Pope, and you've got to believe what the Pope says, that's happened maybe twice. Uh, once in the 1800s, once in the 1900s, both about Mary. We'll be talking a lot more about Mary later. If you've got questions about Mary, uh, feel free to ask me after, uh, after mm -hmm. class here. Uh, but it's not like, you know, all the seminarians and all the priests and all the people from the Secretary of State's office, you know, it's 5 o'clock, it's quitting time, and, you know, they go bustling past Pope Benedict's office and, oh, Holy Father, we're having trouble deciding, pizza or Chinese? And Benedict says, oh, pizza, I mean, <laughs> this is Italy for Pete's sake. That's not an ex cathedra statement, okay? All right, it's, it, it, as a matter of fact, if you read Pope, Den Pope Benedict's book, Jesus of Nazareth, it's a great book. It's very readable. Some of John Paul's stuff was very dense. He was a philosopher, after all. It's very hard to figure out. But, uh, but Pope Benedict was a teacher, okay? He was a professor, he's a theologian, and he's marvelously clear and easy to read. And if you read his Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, in the preface, he says, I just want to point out, you know, it goes without saying, nothing in this book is part of the magisterium. All right, I'm not speaking from the chair here. You're free to accept it or not. So, Pope does that very rarely. Uh, it's much more common for the bishops, which would include the Pope, of course, because he is a bishop, he is the Bishop of Rome, uh, to meet in council, a church council, an ecumenical council, and, uh, and issue a document, write a document, maybe even vote on the document the same way the apostles voted on Matthias, that that vote itself is divinely inspired, uh, and to issue a document that clarifies some teaching of the church, usually in response to a doubt that has arisen. Uh, and I'll talk more about these councils in a few minutes, uh, because there have been a lot of them. Uh, then you have uh, the bishops and the pope who just sort of in their day-to-day -day life and work and statements and ministries uh, follow these norms, some of which may never even get written down, just like the common law. And, and so you've got a hierarchy there. And you can see it. I think it's very interesting to note that theologians form no part of the magisterium, that's very interesting because you've got a whole bunch of crackpot theologians in any age, but especially this one, running around claiming to have discovered all this new stuff. Well, that's great, but they are not infallible. You don't have to pay attention to them. Uh, the church sometimes finds the work of theologians very useful. Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, one of the greatest brains the Western world has produced in the last thousand years. Uh, the church has found his work very useful. Uh, and as a matter of fact, the church has found his greatest work, the Summa, to be without doctrinal error. I think that's the only book that the church has said that of uh, in recently. And by recently, I mean the last thousand years or so. Uh, and also, at the very bottom of the list, you'll notice that priests do not form part of the magisterium. Uh, I think the Catholic Church is unique in that if you do get a fruity priest who is saying that, and I've, I've heard priests say this before, that the resurrection of Jesus wasn't real, uh, it, it wasn't physical, it was a metaphorical resurrection in our hearts. That you can actually say, uh, no, Father, the magisterium of Holy Mother Church says that you're wrong. You know, that the magisterium does not grant the gift of infallibility to individual priests. I wish Father McDonald were here so I could kind of... <laughs> he's probably going to be watching this in a week and I'll be in real trouble. I'm getting a bad penance this Saturday, aren't I, Father? 
uh, I'm sorry, you know what I mean. I, I think Father McDonald would certainly agree with that. Because, as I will talk about later, uh, the last 40 years, the Catholic Church, especially in America, has been plagued with dissenting and outright fruity priests, and more than a few fruity bishops. But magisterium is going to stand against that. Very interesting stuff. So, uh, what happens if you get a, a, a bad priest or bishop? Offer it up, as they say. Time off from purgatory. Grit your teeth and bear it. Um, if you get a bad, yeah, I'm sorry, the question is what if you get a bad bishop or bad priest? Well, there actually are, uh, there is recourse if things are really, really bad. If your priest is doing something, you know, if it's just a, a, a difference of opinion or you don't like the priest's style, then I would say, well, you know, suck it up, deal with it, handle it. If the priest is doing something that is really egregious, uh, then you have not only the right but the duty to to appeal to the bishop, make the bishop aware of what's going on. Oh, uh, yeah. Although firing, yeah, I wouldn't say firing is quite the right word because, but it's, um, it's yeah, it's more of an or. That's the problem. I mean, sometimes I wish that it were a matter of firing, but the bishop has a, a pastoral, organic relationship with his flock. And it's not just a matter of saying, you know, hit the highway. I mean, that, I, I, in the last few years, I wish it were done more readily and more easily than that. Um, it needs to be done. Yes, because, because it is true that the bishops do not work for the Pope. Uh, the bishops hold their authority directly from Christ because Christ commissioned all the disciples uh, after his resurrection. Uh, so, so that does create for, for somewhat of a tension uh, that in some ways... Uh, the bishop need not respond to the Pope, but some bishops have taken that too far. Uh, Archbishop Rembert Weakland uh, of the Archdiocese of Milwaukee several years ago, uh, a very radical bishop, and as it turned out, he was one of the ones implicated in, uh, in the sex abuse scandal. This did not come out until later. Uh, but he decided he was going to give the cathedral in Milwaukee a makeover. And he gutted it. He threw the statues out. He threw out these ancient objects dart that, that were there, where they were beautiful and gorgeous and, and heightened the experience of worship and glorified God. And he turned it into something that looks like the Colosseum. And this was reported to Pope John Paul. And John Paul actually wrote him and saying, Archbishop Weakland, you will stop this. And Weakland did not stop. You know, what do you do with something like that? So it happens. But we'll be talking a lot more about that uh, as we go. All right. Um, I've talked about the ex-cathedral. Let's talk about church councils. How many of you have at least heard, you don't have to know what it means, how many of you have heard the phrase Vatican II? How many of you know what it means? That's my next question. Okay. Well, it was a church council. It was held from 1962 to 1965 in Vatican City. And... It is unfortunate that I think the church today has, and I'm speaking as an historian, I'm speaking as somebody who appreciates the past, who sees us as dwarves on the shoulders of giants by whose grace we see farther than they. I believe that the church is overemphasizing the Second Vatican Council right now, simply because it is so recent. Uh, it is within living memory of a lot of people here and a lot of people in the church, and because it was such a big deal, and it was the first big ecumenical council held uh, in about 400 years, it, it's gotten a lot of traction. It's gotten a lot of press. And I'll give you as my example, if you look in, uh, in this book, uh, practically everything that is cited in it, uh, the table of abbreviations in front, practically everything is from a document of Vatican II. So this is the, <clears throat> the first point at which I want to warn you. Oh, lovely assistant, will you get me some more water? Yeah. <laughs> well, because now you're on my favorite topic. Well, now that you're closer, just even lovelier. <laughs> <clears throat> Touche. All right. Um, there are oh, how many councils? All about twenty ecumenical councils. Twenty-two. I'm seeing twenty-two flashed. Twenty-one. 
uh, 21 ecumenical councils held, I'm going to give it 22, in the last 2,000 years. And that first council, that very first council for people who don't like that, you know, for, for Protestants who love the Bible and who don't like this idea of church councils, that very first council took place in the book of Acts, the conference or council of Jerusalem. Does one have to become Jewish first before he becomes a Christian? The church had to meet. Paul had to meet with Peter to figure that one out. And they decided, no, you do not. So in a sense, the Jerusalem Council was the very first council. So there have been over 20 of these things. That, and these councils issue documents on major points of importance. Uh, was, was Jesus some sort of lesser God? Was he just a man? The Council of Nicaea was called to address this major crisis in the church. Thank you. The pause, the refreshments. So, I want you to be aware that councils don't overrule each other, okay? Doctrine is doctrine. Teaching is teaching. Uh, if it's been infallibly revealed, it's not going to change. It may be understood more fully, more deeply, but it's not going to be overruled or vetoed by a later council. And so I would urge you very much at this point uh, to realize that a lot of what you're going to be reading is biased in favor of Vatican II just because Vatican II is so recent uh, and, and people are naturally going to look at it. But Vatican II is no more or less important than all of the preceding 20 councils. And it's important for you to at least know they exist and that they have decided major, major questions. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop for a minute and see if I'm finally right and ask, do you have any questions about, uh, about anything so far? Like, is it too late to drop and become Eastern Orthodox? Or how did you get that ugly, Dr. Melton? Sick fascination. <laughs> so. Probably what I have to ask about the answer afterwards. Okay. <laughs> Probably a long answer. Okay, but well, maybe not. And uh, but ask me again before we disband, because if you're wondering it, maybe somebody else is as well. Huh? I'm having a difficult time with Dom, and you might not be done with this if you're not. Just tell me. Mm -hmm. but just literal sense and spiritual sense. Yes. Um, the eye and the vine, you're in the branches. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, when I read that today, I might understand that as one thing. Mm -hmm. A year from now, after my life experience has changed, I might read something else. So, mm -hmm. even though it's the same thing, it's hard. It's, I'm, I guess. I guess the question I'm asking is. When we read the scripture, how do we know if we're in the space of God's will of our understanding, or how do we know if it's us and our personal issues? Does that make sense? Yeah, all? that's a that's a very good question. I'm gonna I'm gonna fire from the hip here, and then I'll I'll hand it off to some other folks if they can do better. That um, as long as long you know, if you're reading it in the Catholic tradition and say. This is what, and, and you may not even say this to anybody else. You just may be thinking this in your own mind. Uh, and, and I ought to repeat the question for the, for the vid camera, that how do you know if your interpretations are correct? Um, biblical interpretations. I would say that as long as you always read with the proviso that um, if you find a Catholic doctrine that says you're wrong, you will abandon your erroneous interpretation, uh, then, then you're fine. You're good. And so is this, the catechism, is that doctrine? Is that, I mean, what is doctrine? Doctrine, uh, once again, doctrine uh, literally means teaching. Uh, from, for instance, doctor means teacher, which is why I'm angry at physicians for having stolen the title from teachers. Uh, it should be, you know, physician this or physician that. Doctors are teachers. And so doctrine is an official teaching of the church, um, and it can be solemnly defined by ex cathedra or by a council, in which case it becomes dogma, which is sort of like doctrine squared. But you find these in many things. You find them in docu the conciliar documents. 
you find them in some scriptural passages. Uh, you find them in apostolic letters. So this book is just trying to highlight us the, the key ones first to get started? Yes. That book is not doctrine. It is a gloss on the teachings of the church. Uh, so, and, and that is really when you, find, uh, when you find people breaking away from the church. And Luther is probably the best known example of that. By, by no means was he the first or the only one. That, that theolog you know, there are many theologians. Uh, Benedict is a theologian. He comes up with ideas. He comes up with thoughts. He tosses them around. Uh, bishops, popes, uh, laypersons, a lot of them are theologians. And sometimes they, they move in the wrong direction. And if it's on a big enough subject and it gets enough traction and people start talking about it, then controversy may erupt. And then maybe the local bishop or a church council or a pope says, no, my child, sorry. All right, the question is, what do you do at that point? Uh, the, the faithful Catholic will accept the correction and move on. And as a matter of fact, you'll find a lot of Catholic writings that will say in the preface, I offer this, this work of theology uh, without any intent to attack or subvert the teaching of the church. You know, I'm, so. Or you'll have somebody who says, well, I'm not out of step. The band is out of step. So, and, and then they go their own way. I guess, the, I guess what I'm having a hard time with is the big, big picture and then the, you know, the little Kelly. You know what I mean? Like, here's me, my little self, and there's, a, there's a really big picture that seems like, I mean, it says in our book that we'll never understand all the mysteries. Mm -hmm. Never. Yeah. But I feel so teeny tiny in this big, big picture, and I guess I do mean my daily personal, you know, I do all my three kids, and I'm thinking, mm -hmm. should I beat them or not? You know, like, <laughs> I mean. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Mark, if, if you've got a minute, can you look up uh, Thomas Merton's prayer? Uh, you know the one I'm talking about? <laughs> Read my mind, dude. Well, I'll try to do it then. That, that God, uh, you know, I don't know if I'm moving in the right direction. I don't know if I'm getting this right. I don't know if I'm doing what you want to. But then the operative line I like. But I believe that the desire to please you in itself pleases you. Don't get too hung up on doctrine that... I'm doing, I'm doing it right. Am I, if, I, if I take that last piece of pie, am I going to go to hell? Oh, I don't want to. Yeah. That's not what doctrine's supposed to do. It's not supposed to make you uptight. You want to jump in and help here? Well, it's just, you talk about in terms of interpreting scripture. I, I always tell people, you know, first place looking at as long as it doesn't contradict something in the creeds, that's the first place. Mm -hmm. You're talking about theology and how you read the Bible and how you want to interpret it yourself. So certainly, the creeds are a guide for something like that. And if you're talking about day-to-day -day moral decisions, I mean, that gets, you know, that's different. Yeah, and there, there are a lot of ways around that, too. But, but yes, I, I would say as a first... What you just said really, I think, nails it. Does that help? Okay, okay, good. When you say, my desire to please... Yeah. Kind of like, you know, God's will in my prayers, I sometimes try to ask for that, but I don't know how to know if in my mind is working mm -hmm. or, you know... And I guess the desire to follow God's will... You know, probably gives me a pretty good way. That's kind of, yeah, it does. That gets you a long way. Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. Yes. The prayer of the man with the doctrine. Very good. Very good. Um, yeah, that, you know, a lot of the big doctrinal issues you're probably not going to be facing day to day. Um, that, you know, just get through the best you can with the best of intentions. Um, that, remember one of the first things I said is that there are a whole lot of things that the church says, go to it, believe what you want. Uh, G.K. Chesterton, who was one of the most famous converts of the 20th century, said, um, yes, uh, part of Catholicism uh, consists of very fine and well-ordered grounds on the estate. But there's also plenty of room out there for hunting and fishing as well, if that's what you want to do. Um, if you want to go further than that, many Catholics have a spiritual director, somebody who is uh, well-versed in scripture and church tradition and can be a sounding board for any uh, personal issues you're having, personal troubles. Uh, if you have a regular confessor, he too can help out. God, oh, God loves me too, too much. God loves all his children. He would never send any of us to hell. He would never send me to hell. That's presuming on God's mercy. 
That's probably, if you believe that, that's probably the fastest way to get to hell. <laughs> okay? So those are the two extremes. Um, so you, you need to make sure... Hmm. There you go. So, um, uh, act, uh, been burned at the stake by one side or the other. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's a very touchy, very ugly term, but the basic root of it simply means wrong teaching. So let's just keep it at that level as a technical term, that the Catholic Church believes that the Baptists are heretics. That's okay. The Baptists believe that the Catholic Church are heretics. You know, let's, let's just get it out. Well, mm -hmm. Well, well, we'll talk about that. There are, it certainly holds some heretical teachings. Um, but let's just say that this is a good faith disagreement so we can hop over the ugly connotations of that term and, and keep on going. That the very first heresy appeared almost immediately after Jesus' ascension. It was the heresy of Gnosticism. Uh, it was an Eastern idea. I don't want to get into too much. But the, the basic driving idea behind Gnosticism is that the material world was evil. And this actually began to infect the church. The church, if you will find in the later writings of the New Testament, was beginning to respond already to Gnosticism in those writings. The Gospel of John, for instance. Uh, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That, that line, a very important phrase in so many ways, was probably, among other things, written in direct response to Gnosticism that God himself took on flesh, therefore how can God be evil? How can, how can flesh be evil? Um, but the people who heard the truth as preached by John, some people still said, no, the band is out of step. And they turned away from it. People are going to be turning away from the Catholic Church at all stages of her existence. Uh, so, the, really the only thing you have to profess to be a Catholic, uh, and this is the one thing, I would argue this is the only thing that differentiates Catholics from Protestants. There's only one difference. And y'all are probably going, oh, you nuts, you crazy, have you... Yeah. No, there's only one difference. That a Catholic believes that everything that has been revealed infallibly by the Holy Spirit, well, I praise that wrong, that Catholic doctrine has been revealed infallibly by the Holy Spirit that in teaching doctrine, in teaching the truth about God, which is where we came in tonight, the church cannot commit an error. God loves his people too much to let the church do that. And that Protestants believe that the church can, has, and does commit doctrinal errors. And the best statement of that you find Luther saying at the Diet of Worms, unless I am convinced by scripture or by right reason of the truth of something, then I'm not going to believe it. I'm not going to believe popes and councils because they have contradicted each other. This I believe, here I stand, I can do an order, God help me, amen. I would say Luther, well first of all, it's very clear that Luther was scrupulous, but we won't go there. But second of all, and that's a terrible thing to have to deal with, I'm not slamming him for that. But the other thing is, interpretation is kind of complicated. Uh, ask a lawyer who interprets things for a living. Uh, so his statement that popes and councils had contradicted each other was definitely wrong. But interpretation is a tricky thing. So as long as you say, I accept what the church teaches, and you act on that to the best of your ability, that's all you have to believe. All the other beliefs will flow from that. Other questions? We have secret questions. We have secret questions. Do you want to answer these? You want to answer we'll find out what they are first. Oh, well then, you're going to give me the bad ones, aren't you? There's only two. Okay. You can do that one, because you may not know the readings for the day. In today's readings, why did Jesus pray so hard? My first answer, and then anybody who knows better than I can feel free to supplement this, was that one of the most important things Jesus did was to set an example for us. And one of the th ways is to pray without ceasing. Uh, there are some monastic traditions that I think the goal is to reach a point where you are praying with every waking breath. Every single moment of your day, you are, you are offering prayers. Uh, and Jesus gave an example for doing this. Gave us an example for this. 
Uh, does anybody want to throw in any other reasons for that? Yes? It's where he got his strength. Yes. I, Yes, he was. He came back and he, he asked the father for strength and went into strength. I said this a thousand times, but Jesus died on the cross, but he won that victory in the garden where he was kneeling down. And Father said, Father, it's not my will, but I am done in prayer. Is there even Hebrews too? Hang it for a second and then I'll let you. I want to I follow up on what Jerry said because I think it's very important that. Jesus and God the Father have a relationship that God the Father gives everything to the Son out of love, out of selfless love. And God the Son, out of his own selfless love, gives everything back to God the Father. And the conduit, if you will, the, the love itself that is given is so strong that it's the person of the Holy Spirit. And so this is, this is how Jesus partakes in the Godhead, in the Trinity. Uh, that Jesus is, and this is one of the great mysteries of the faith, 100% human being. He's not a hologram. He's not a spectral image. Uh, he's 100% human being. And at the same time, he is 100% completely God. Now, what is 100% of something plus 100% of something? Normally, it would be 200% of something, but in the mathematics of the Godhead, no. This is the thing. Is he God or is he man? Yes. He's not half God and half man. He's not God pretending to be man. He's not a man who has somehow been adopted by God. He is a God who is man. Don't try to get your head around it. And that prayer, I think, is, is part of that connection that he's got with the rest of the Trinity. Uh, all right. Will you read it for me? Sure. <clears throat> So the reading is from Hebrews, which I think is important in order to understand uh, the importance of it. And the, it's just the first line from chapter 5, verse 7 of Hebrews. And it says, Who in the days of his flesh with a strong cry and tears, offering up prayers and supplications to him that was able to save him from death, was heard for his reverence. So to me it's important that it's a reading from Hebrews, which talks about Christ as the, you know, the eternal high priest, uh, the high priest... Uh, of which previous uh, high priests in the Israeli uh, tradition were uh, mere figures. And so Christ, when he you know, suffers and dies, enters into the true holy of holies, that is heaven. And Hebrews is kind of going into this idea. And so that's, that's the whole point of the loud cries and supplications, is that Christ is our high priest, continuing to intervene for us with his tears and supplications. Very good. Next question. <clears throat> In trying to describe why evil exists in the world, many religious scholars will answer this looking only at God. For instance, God allows this evil because, or God uses evil for the purpose of good, etc., both of which are true, by the way. Uh, at what point do we acknowledge that Satan is the one responsible for evil? Why do we always add so many dimensions to God without bringing up the evil one? Are not angels and demons at war even as we speak? Well, I'd like to start with a broader philosophical outlook. Uh, this was a, uh, a conundrum raised, uh, it's called the Epicurean Dilemma, raised by the philosopher Epicurus. And I think that any world religion, uh, Catholic, Protestant, non-Abrahamic, Dharmic, you name it, uh, has got at some point to wrestle with this dilemma if it's going to have any legitimacy at all. If God is all good and God is all powerful, how is it that evil exists? That's a deep one. I mean, you could, you could spend your life pondering about that. Um, that uh, we do hold that Satan, the first and highest of the angels, a created being, looked God in the eye and said in Latin, non servium. I see what you are, I know what you are, I have full knowledge of you, and I choose to reject you. I will not serve. That's the essence of sin. Now, 
when human beings were created, they ended up doing the same thing. I will not serve. I mean, what part of don't eat that didn't they get? Now, it was true that they were tempted by the serpent. And by the way, serpent is a, is a very pale uh, sort of translation of it. Uh, dragon would probably be a better one. You know, not some little hissing, you know, dra you know very formidable. Uh, that if you think about Satan's nature, if you think about the, the nature of an angel, uh, this is probably the most powerful created being in the universe. And, you know, the, the likelihood of a human being to stand up against him, not so much. Not so good. That being said, you don't want to go too far in the other direction. You remember, anybody here remember Flip Wilson? Anybody here young and enough, old enough to remember Flip Wilson? What was, his, what was Geraldine's throwaway line? The devil made me do it. You know, he always do something bad. The devil made me do it. This is important to understand. Satan cannot make you do anything. You have free will. Now, due to original sin, you are going to be drawn to the evil. But nobody's going to make you do it. That's, I mean, that's the whole nature of free will. That if you are forced to commit an evil act, anybody here like Andrew Lloyd Webber, uh, Phantom of the Opera, I know, I'm a bit of a Philistine, but I like Phantom of the Opera. I love it. Uh, he's, he's written a Requiem. It's a very interesting Requiem. Uh, it is scored for a man, a girl, and a boy. And he wrote it, I think, so he could, have, he could get his future wife, Sarah Brightman, to sing an operatic part or something like that. But she was in it. Um, but he says that the reason he wrote this Requiem and scored it for man, girl, or young woman, and boy uh, was because he had read about some story about the killing fields of Cambodia and a boy who was given the choice by one of Pol Pot's people and said you can either kill your sister or we're gonna kill you. What do you do in a situation like that? What do you do in a situation like that? Uh, w was he being made to kill his sister? You start understanding Okay, yeah. well, what about this? Let me make it an easier one. Any, any sleepwalkers in here? I used to sleepwalk. Okay. I wake up. At, I'm not even going to give you a hypothetical. There's actually, there are actually two cases that I know about are on this. Sleepwalker shoots spouse in his sleep. Now, assuming, assuming that we prove beyond a shadow of a doubt, that we really accept that it was sleepwalking, was he guilty of anything? No. Okay? So, I push you, you fall against somebody, that somebody falls down and breaks his head. Are you, are you guilty? Or am I? See this whole issue of free will. You know, if, if you choose it, if you freely choose it, then it's a sin. If you don't, it's not a sin. But, there are lots of things out in the world, and by world, I mean this whole creation, the universe, whatever. Satan, the other fallen angels who are going to make the wrong thing very, very tempting for you. You will find that climbing uphill is very hard. Sliding down into the muck is very easy. Okay? I don't know if I'm answering the question well enough. Uh, but yes, Catholicism holds that there are these invisible created beings, legions of them. Some of them are faithful to God, some of them are not. And those who are not are frankly after you. Read the screw tape letters if you really want to get chilled. It is terrifying. Yes? Well, was the question, was the question just talking about the problem of evil and why does it exist? No, it was more, why do we not hear more about Satan than we do? Uh, and we do need to keep that in mind. Uh, once again, the modern era, uh, you know, it's, it's somehow seen as not cool to talk about Satan. Uh, but it is a matter of doctrine that Satan and fallen angels exist. And they have a hierarchy. Hmm? They have a hierarchy too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In the reverse of heaven. So, what, another qu was there a question? I was just going to say that when I think about it, I have to focus in on the free will part. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where you can reconcile God is all good, God is all powerful, mm -hmm. yet evil still exists mm -hmm. in the universe because God created free will. Yeah. Why would he create free will? 
Well, in healing these sacraments specifically because he created us in his own likeness mm -hmm. so that he would love us and we voluntarily for our own volition would in return and mimicking the father's relationship to the son love him completely for our own free will and thus but also thus allowing the possibility of evil and sin to enter into the is there a difference between a lover and a rapist? If God took away our free will, thus forcing us to love Him, what does anybody get out of that? But if God sets us free, and like a lover hopes that we will love Him back, and the only way that works is if we're free not to love Him, do you see the difference in those two images? Yes. Such that he being perfect created us with free will because that was a part of his perfection to create a creature that was free and capable of making decisions on their own. And by the same token, his will is permissive. It allows us, if, if we choose, to make mistakes and commit sin. So, you know, it's complex, but if God is a perfect being, then it was more perfect, <laughs> it was more perfect mm -hmm. for him to create a free creature than it would have been for him to create a creature that was not free, but that would act perfectly in every way. Hmm. So, that's it, deep. It's complicated theologically. Yes, but the that, perfect will part. That's part of understanding the problem of evil. Mm -hmm. God doesn't create evil. It's really not completely correct to say he allows it, but he does. Mm -hmm. Yes. Through us. So, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, this is out of uh, James, first chapter. Uh, you look at 13 verse. Let no man say when he is tempted that he is tempted by God, for God is no tempter to evil. And he himself tempts no one. But everyone is tempted by being drawn away and enticed by his own head. So he has free will. Without God, you can do nothing. I'm going to make one quick final comment on that, and then we'll quick because it's 8:30. Uh, has anybody here read the book, The Exorcist? Not not seen the movie, but the book. It's, it's a, it, is an, it was written around 1970, I think, and it was a great commentary on the state of the church in America in 1970, and to a degree still today. Uh, you've got this hip, young, groovy Jesuit priest who teaches at Georgetown, and this woman approaches him and says, you know, I think the best. And this priest who is hip and groovy and into science and you know, doesn't really believe all this stupid stuff about demons and things. Yeah, he comes in and checks her out and he says, well, you know, all these things are psychosomatic and well, yeah, she figured out what I was thinking, but that was ESP and science has proven the existence of ESP. Oh, that was so 70s. And, you know, he keeps on rationalizing this stuff away until finally these words rise up on her skin saying, help me. And his eyes bug out and at that point he realizes he's out of his depth and they call in another priest and you you really don't get this in the movie this the movie fumbles this horribly but when the mother opens the door to this new priest uh, and he's not new he's a, he's an elderly priest uh, he's old-fashioned he believes in things like Satan and when she opens the door she feels this wave of holiness and godliness reach out to her and it's like so the hip young groovy priest who doesn't really think talking about Satan is cool is completely unprepared to deal with him and it's the old priest who actually what believes in shall I say it the teachings of the church who is the one who is successful yeah and in the movie mm -hmm. the best scene was when the Jesuit psychiatrist priest goes to the old priest for the first time with the case chart yes and he says well father so far there's been three personalities and the priest says oh, there's only one yeah. mm -hmm. that is the best yes. scene in the movie yeah, so, all right, uh, I'm going to call time if you think it should. I'm going to stay around if anybody's got any further questions, though. Stay as long as you would like. Uh, and, uh, well, appreciate your attention tonight. And